Uh, what's up guys? I wanted to do a quick video here kind of on um, different stuff for your diet. So I'm going to go ahead and just take some notes here um, so that you guys can kind of follow along if you're not really paying attention with audio and we'll kind of hopefully hold your attention a little bit better. So uh, a jumper basically needs to be very light. Um, so to, to, the reason for that basically is just F net equals MA. If you want to accelerate a mass, um, you know, you have to apply a certain force. So if you have, uh, sorry, FA equals MA. So if you have a low, low mass, um, then you, then to get um, the same or better acceleration, um, you need less, or you need less force, all right? So for example, if we have an athlete that weighs 100 kilos, right? So 100 kilogram athlete, um, and that athlete accelerates uh, at four meters per second vertically, um, we need a mass or a force, right? So force equals mass uh, times acceleration. So our force is gonna be equal to that 100 kg athlete times that four meters per second. And that would give us our acceleration, um, whatever, I don't know what the units are, but hypothetically, let's just say it's a force of 400 kilograms uh, meter per second, which is kind of a ridiculous measure, but uh, would give you an idea of, of how much force you would need to apply, right? So now let's say if we take the same athlete and we reduce their mass to uh, 70 kilograms, right? So now force equals the mass, which is uh, 70 kilograms, which is like 155 pounds, something like that, um, times that same uh, four meters per second, right? And now we only need, um, that would be 280, uh, whatever that is, like kilogram meters per second or something like that. Uh, so just to, like I said, put that in perspective for you, that's considerably, um, actually it's times, sorry. There's no way to do this easily. Kilograms times meters per second, which is not really a unit, but just for the sake of this, uh, example, you can kind of tell how much force they would need to apply, right? So being lighter is better because if you're lighter, then you don't necessarily have to apply as much force. The downside to this, obviously, is that you're going. It's going to be very hard for you to produce that much force if um, you know if you are really light. So you have to be able to produce a lot of force and stay light which basically comes to this conundrum of, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we increase our relevant muscle mass, all right? So how do we increase the relevant muscle mass, all right? And then what is, the, what is relevant muscle mass, right? So a lot of times people will say, you know, I want to do upper body or something like that, but they don't necessarily pay attention to the fact that increasing their upper body mass is going to increase mass that isn't necessarily helping them jump higher. Um, you could increase your takeoff center of mass position because if your hands are over your head, then your center of mass is going to increase in height. But then if you have more massive arms, the more of your mass is higher, but you still have to accelerate that mass. And I would argue that it's better to stay as light as possible and try to increase your, your force application um, than it is to try to just gain mass. Uh, so it kind of brings us to a couple strategies to maintain a very low mass um, while trying to jump very high, right? So some of you guys might say, well, how am I going to get stronger, or increase my force without gaining weight? And uh, physiologically, that happens through uh, increased motor potential, which basically just means that you are able to recruit more motor units in a given period of time. So when you're when you're doing things like squatting or power cleans or something like that, that is rate of force development. So you're producing force faster or better um, by recruiting more motor units, and these neurological, I guess you could say, neuromuscular adaptations increase your jump height, uh, increase power or force without uh, a substantial increase in mass. Now, once you get to a certain point, you have to increase the cross-sectional area um, of the muscle 
to increase the jump height, or increase force, sorry, increase the force, which will increase jump height if you don't gain too much mass. All right, so that's a big if then statement. And typically if you're gonna gain mass and you're staying lean and it's lean muscle mass in your legs, it's usually gonna benefit you. Um, very rarely have I, have I seen that it doesn't benefit them, right? So again, what strategies, um, what strategies can we use that are, uh, that are research-based, research-backed to some degree, uh, safe, and effective, right? And so I wanted to kind of talk about um, one strategy in particular that I do think is good for jumpers, and I've tested it on myself, and I've tested it on a lot of other jumpers, and I know a lot of jumpers that do it, and that is intermittent fasting. Um, and a lot of people, I don't know, there's different ways to do it. I'm not an expert on it. I'm not telling you to do this. I'm just saying this is one strategy to use. And basically the idea is that you fast for a period of time. You don't eat anything. You can drink water and coffee and tea. There's different flexibilities to it. But you basically want to minimize um, minimize any food intake, uh, which essentially helps you uh, produce ketones. Well, what happens is you produce ketones uh, in the body that fuels the brain. And this is from fat metabolism. So how you do it essentially is, well, you minimize food intake for a period of time. All right, and so one of the things that that is going to do, again, is potentially cause uh, tissue to break down during that period of fasting and produce ketones. So a lot of the times people don't like that because they will have a tendency to lose uh, muscle mass sometimes. Um, they will have a tendency to also lose fat mass though. So it can be a benefit for people to do that because you're gonna overall, overall you're gonna decrease mass. And with people doing my programs, they'll still increase the force production as a result of the training. Um, but a lot of the time people have a hard time maintaining that fast because after they train, they're very like hungry. And so one way that you can do the fast and um, still maintain the training is essentially by eating, uh, eating after you train. So for example, if you train at, uh, if you train at like four or five, so let's just say you train at five and you wanna do a 12 hour fast, that means your last meal is gonna be at 5 p.m. So that would give you, you know, your, um, your, your 12 hour fast and every time, or sorry, I have to think about this. Um, if you train at five, your last, you could, <laughs> if you train at five, your last meal, and let's say you're, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this. You want to eat after you train, right? And so let's say you train at five, um, start eating at seven, right? And you would basically stop eating 12 hours, like 12 hours before you would eat again. So you'd take 7 p.m. and you'd work backwards 12 hours. Um, and so you would you want to not make sure you're not eating at, let's see, what would that be? So 7 a.m. would be the 12 hour, the 12 hour mark. So from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., you're not eating, you're fasting. Okay, so 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., you're fasting, which means you are basically not eating through the entire day and through your session, but directly after your session uh, until, you know, whatever, 7 a.m. the next day, you can eat. And typically during that period of time, you do want to take in a good deal of, of calories. Um, and what I've noticed is it doesn't really matter as much about what you're actually eating. It just matters that you're taking in, um, a lot of food. So just so we know that this isn't just some, some BS that I put together, I kind of went through and, uh, typed in intermittent fasting to Google scholar, just a quick search of, you know, relevant articles, um, that have discussed it and, you know, looked at its effects and, and things like that. And just by looking at this page, you can tell there actually is a, a good deal of research showing that it, it could be beneficial. So for example, this is cited 476 times, um, you know, written or published in 2005. 
and you know when you click on this and you even though we we probably do have access to the full thing to the full PDF but um, I'm not gonna bore you guys with that um, but it says intermittent fasting or reduce meal frequency and caloric restriction uh, extend lifespan and increase resistance to age-related diseases and rodents and monkeys so obviously and improve the health of overweight humans so both uh, intermittent fasting and caloric restriction enhance cardiovascular and brain functions and improve several risk factors for coronary artery disease and stroke, including reduction in blood pressure and increased insulin sensitivity. So basically what that means is you're having positive adaptations to your cardiorespiratory system and to your insulin sensitivity. So this is stopping type 2 diabetes, this is stopping heart disease, and you're also losing weight. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there's one just... Quick example, you know, if you wanted to read that study, it's right here, um, beneficial effects of intermittent fasting. That's just one quick one. Like I said, I'm not really going to go into like all of the details of this, but I did want to, you know, at least make sure that we had some, you know, credible research supporting it uh, instead of just object or subjectively saying, you know, it worked for me or whatever else. It has worked for me. But, you know, I want to make sure, again, that we're doing something that is evidence based that does have research behind it. Um, and like I said, if you guys want to read the full articles, they're here. They're probably, you know, fine, valid studies. They're cited 167 times or 476 times. So we know they're, they're pretty good. So caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, alter spectral measures of heart rate and blood pressure variability in rats. So if we, again, wanted to see, okay, what actually is, you know, happening here. Um, so it's saying dietary restriction has been shown to increase lifespan, delay, or prevent age-associated diseases and improve functional and metabolic cardiovascular risk factors in rodents and other species. To investigate the effects of dietary restriction on beat-to-beat -beat heart rate and diastolic blood pressure variability in male rats, we implanted transmitters, um, they restricted feeding, so they reduced calories a lot. That's way more than a normal person would be. And they were all found to, so body weight, heart rate, and, di and systolic and diastolic blood pressure were all found to decrease in response to dietary restrictions. So basically, intermittent fasting and caloric restriction in rats, again, they're seeing these positive me uh, metrics to show that, hey, you know what, this is helping, you know, these animals. Um, so here we go. Again, this is alternate day fasting in humans, so kind of what's going on here. Um, so it says caloric restriction and alternate day fasting represent two different forms of dietary restriction. Although the effects of caloric restriction on chronic disease prevention were reviewed previously, the effects of alternating day fasting or chronic disease risk have yet to be summarized on chronic disease risk. Accordingly, we review here animal and human evidence um, according, uh, concerning alternate day fasting and the risk of certain chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. Um, they're comparing these. Okay, so in terms of diabetes risk, animal studies find that lower diabetes incidence and lower fasting glucose and insulin concentrations. So basically that means in animals, they're finding positive responses to the metrics that they were looking at. Human trials, uh, greater insulin mediated glucose uptake, but no effect on fasting glucose or insulin concentration. Um, I'm not sure what insulin mediated glucose uptake. Greater. Okay, so basically that means their insulin sensitivity increased. Sorry, uh, it took me a second because they wrote that kind of interestingly. Um, and then cardiovascular disease risk, we'll just go to the humans. Limited human evidence suggests higher HDL cholesterol concentrations and lower triglyceride concentrations, but no effect on blood pressure. So just so we're clear, HDL, um, I think HDL is actually the bad one. Uh, I want to go ahead and just be sure. So again, like, like I said, there are some studies that do show that, Hey, there is potentially bad results associated with intermittent fasting. Um, so it's not all good, uh, potentially. I don't know that for sure. I want to just real quick. We just do a Google, Google search here. We'll just see which one's good and which one's bad. Okay. So that's the good cholesterol. So actually what, what that means is that it's, intermittent fasting actually was good for the um, intermittent fasting was actually good in me, for your cholesterol, meaning that, you know, if, if you do intermittent fast, it, it can help your cholesterol. It can help um, the metrics associated with 
um, you know, a healthy heart or cardiovascular disease. So again, we're seeing more, you know, positive effects of this, but let's go ahead and let's use some of the risks here because a lot of people don't really talk about um, the risks associated with intermittent fasting. And I feel like, you know, it's important to know both sides of the, uh, of the argument here and say, you know, is it good? Is it bad? What, what are the risks also associated with this? I mean, again, we've only looked at three or two, three studies, but um, I think it would be good to uh, to just consider some of the risks associated with this. So intermittent improvement in coronary heart disease risk factors during intermittent fasting. So let's see, I'm trying to look for a bad one. Metabolic disease risk markers, effects of intermittent or continuous energy restriction on weight loss, beneficial effects cardio production seems like most of this is good but health effects of intermittent fasting or mesis or harm this is good this will be a good one 2015 so this is kind of looks like a systematic review there there yep systematic review kind of going over everything here and basically what this is going to look at is okay design so objective um, sought to identify rigorous clinically relevant research studies that provide high quality evidence that therapeutic fasting regimens are clinically beneficial to humans. Um, so here's the design. Let's just see the, the conclusion. Clinical research studies on fasting with robust design and high levels of clinical evidence are sparse in, in literature. So that is bad. That means that basically they're not finding a lot of good evidence um, on intermittent fasting. The few randomized controlled trials and observational clinical outcome studies support the existence of health benefits from fasting. Substantial further research in humans is needed before the use of fasting as a health intervention can be recommended. So basically they're saying there's not a lot of studies for it, but the ones that they do have is, you know, they are showing positive outcomes. All right, so we're going to stop with that. Um, I'm not going to bore you guys to death, but basically, you know, we are seeing health benefits associated with intermittent fasting. You now for athletes because that's what you guys are wondering about for athletes what are the risks associated with this um you know i think probably the biggest risks um for you guys are muscle wasting um you know so because you're not eating for a period of time you know it is possible for you to lose muscle mass uh especially in areas that you aren't training so it could be you know upper body mass um it could be upper body mass, it could be <laughs> your neck or your shoulders or, or things like that. Um, and that's just because you're not using them. If you are an elite and you are using those muscles in say cleans or something like that, you probably won't see a decrease in mass. Um, Isaiah's had really positive responses to it. So, uh, you know, it, it does really depend on the person. Um, in this scenario, you know, I, I showed you some of the risks associated you know, or some of the benefits with the heart, but as an athlete, you know, your goal is to increase your, your relevant muscle tissue. And if you want to jump higher, that's your goal. But if you're trying to just be a high jumper and your end goal is to jump as high as possible, this might be a valid strategy to, um, you know, increase your, your vertical. Um, you know, you want a low mass and you want to increase force. I can tell you from experience, I've done both of those things and intermittent fasted. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's some of the research on it, guys. Um, you know, some of the risks and the benefits and things like that uh, just other risks associated with it. I mean, <laughs> like if you fast, you know, there is, there are other things you have to consider. So I'm not telling you to do this. I'm just saying here are the benefits, here are the risks. Um, another risk is you could get lightheaded or, or, or dizzy because of, uh, because of blood sugar. Um, so I wouldn't recommend doing this for anyone who has diabetes or if you have any disease associated with that, or you know, that happens. Um, one of the biggest things is like, if it works for you or if it works, it works. Meaning if you, if you can do it, then you can do it. But some people just can't, some people just can't do it. They don't like it. I love it. I don't like waking up and eating. I like, you know, waiting till later in the day until I'm, I'm hungry and then I just crush all the food. Um, but that's not for everyone. Um, I'm just telling you guys one potential strategy and, and, you know, maybe I can do more of these videos if you guys find it interesting, but, um, you know, it has worked for me. It's been really effective for me. I went pretty from pretty lean to or so not being so um from pretty fat actually to pretty lean i don't know how else to say that uh but i mean you know there was some 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 good evidence for you know its efficacy um if you just go to my profile here actually um you know and you look at the changes in body composition from from using intermittent fasting i actually think that this is down right now uh i had a lot of positive outcomes from it uh, my stories aren't going to load here but 
one of these stories basically shows my, my body composition changing from month to month. And I, I did lose a lot of weight, um, you know, and, and throughout the time I was training, you know, my vertical did go up a good amount. You know, you can see that here. Um, you know, I still was jumping higher and then continued to jump even higher as I, as I continue to train. So, you know, you, you can still train and get better and get leaner. I mean, you can definitely tell that my arms are smaller and things like that, but I didn't touch upper body at all. Um, you know, people like Barth, Connor Barth and Isaiah, they've actually, you know, been gaining weight, um, on the elite program. And I think Isaiah is fasting. And so it's just, he's just gaining muscle mass just because the training is intense and his body is synthesizing muscle faster than he's, you know, losing it. Um, so this risk of muscle wasting is just not being overcome by the fact that he's training so hard and inducing so much stress, um, that his body, you know, is adapting. Uh, the last thing to consider too, that I, and I didn't really mention this in risks is that it is a stress to the body. So, uh, it is, and you know, that it has to be considered, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get higher quality training in, it's going to be really tough if you intermittent fast, because you're going to go into a workout fasted. Um, so on elite, it's really hard to do. That's why I recommend, you know, fasting in a way that you can eat, you know, either directly after you train or just right before. So this would be shifted from 5 a.m. to 7 uh, to 5 p.m. So you'd eat right before your workout or during your workout, um, you know, and then kind of go about it that way. But that's kind of the the news on that, guys. If you're if you liked it, if you're interested, comment, ask questions, whatever else. Um, I kind of just did this on the fly and improvised on it, but um, thought I would give you guys a, a good kind of rundown of, of that. So 